This message comes from Legal Talk sponsor, Choice New York Management. The heart of every building is its people, and Choice New York knows how to find the right people to deliver a first-class experience. Staffing by Choice is the premium provider of building services in New York City. Serving New York's residential and commercial buildings for 15 years, our philosophy is simple. Your home, our priority. Visit choicenewyork.com to learn more. Welcome to Legal Talk, a conversation about governance issues that New York's co-op and condo boards are tackling today. I'm Carol Ott with Habitat, the New York City magazine for co-op and condo board directors. My guest today is Andrew Brucker, a partner at the law firm Armstrong Teasdale. Every co-op has a proprietary lease, and this document stakes out the rights and responsibilities of shareholders and the board of directors. But it's not written in plain English. So while it's extremely important, it's very dense. That said, it needs to be updated every five or ten years. Andy, what are some of the provisions that boards should revisit and modernize and why? I just want to start off by reminding everybody there's actually three important governing documents in every co-op. One is the bylaws, which sets forth the rights and obligations of being a shareholder in a cooperative corporation. The other is the proprietary lease, which is sometimes called an occupancy agreement. The proprietary lease sets forth your rights and obligations as a tenant in the building. And then there are the house rules. The proprietary lease should be looked at because times change. For example, many years ago, shareholders just simply didn't have insurance. Nowadays, that's the number one provision I think that should be added to the proprietary lease, a requirement that everybody acquire homeowner's insurance. Now, homeowner's insurance actually has two parts. One is liability aspect, and the other is a property aspect. For example, if your neighbor upstairs has a leak and destroys some of your couches, you want to be able to replace your couch, you should have insurance covering your own property. But the liability insurance is much more important. I'm going to give you an example, and it sounds as if I'm making it up. It sounds fictional, but it's true. Somebody has a leak upstairs and they live on the 10th floor. And before long, because it's a weekend and they're not around, the leak goes all the way down eight floors. It destroys some of the property of the people living below them. And worse, the water hits the walls in all these lower floors. And of course, the walls have to be replaced. And of course, where there's water, guess what? There's mold. So there's going to have to be mold remediation. The person upstairs who caused it, it might have been by accident or it may not have been. That person might be held liable. If you have your own liability insurance, the insurance company will take care of it for you. So you don't have to worry if you're actually sued. So the first thing I would do is look at the insurance provision. The average lease just doesn't have it. Probably the number one issue nowadays when it comes to living in a co-op are noise issues. Now, every lease does have a noise provision. There's a little something in there that says you shouldn't make noise And in fact, you should have floor covering of at least 80% of your apartment, excluding kitchens, hallways, foyer, and closets. That's a lot of exclusions, by the way. But that's what typically it says. I think that should be looked at carefully. And I'm going to say something I wouldn't have said three years ago. And that is, this is especially true because of the pandemic. So many people are working from their home that normal day-to-day noises never bothered them when they got home at eight at night. But if you're working from your home 24 hours, there are all kinds of noise that will bother you. So one of the ways you can improve the living conditions of everybody in a co-op is to beef up that noise provision in the lease. But there's something else, and that maybe this is pandemic related, maybe this is just New Yorkers, but A lot of people have exercise equipment, whether it's a Peloton or a treadmill or a stepping machine. And if you've ever lived underneath one, it can drive you crazy. So what I like to do is add something in the noise provision that says any exercise equipment has to have extra padding and it has to be approved by management. 
Believe me, if you lived underneath somebody who likes to exercise a lot, you'll thank me for that. What about fines? The only remedy a co-op typically has when somebody's doing something wrong, when they violate the house rules or violate a lease, is terminate the lease and evict the person. But that's so extreme that courts just don't like to do that. Fines are a good way of getting people to obey the rules of the co-op. And what you can do is you can have a schedule so nobody's surprised by it. We'll send out and publish to everybody what the fines are. And you'd be surprised. It may work because nobody likes to get a $100 fine. You, you can charge them $10,000 for a new floor, but a $100 fine really bugs people. And I will tell you, many of my buildings have it, $100 for the first offense and 200 for the second and for other ones. So it builds up. So if, for example, you have people in a no smoking building who now smoke, if you do have fines and they continue to violate the no smoking rule, you'll find that adds up quickly. And at a certain point, they're going to say, hey, something's got to give here. So I would say that you need to look at and review your lease. That's something that should be added if you don't have it already. So let me just ask you, the process then for either modernizing these provisions or adding new provisions, that requires approval by everybody, a majority? Yeah, it requires a super majority. It could be 66 and two thirds of all the shareholders. It could be 70% or 75%. You have to check the proprietary lease itself. I, I will say this, having the vote alone is not what you should be aiming at. What you should be aiming at is informing people. What I suggest is that the board work with the attorney, come up with a good changes, and then send it out to everybody. Have an informational meeting, even have two informational meetings. Get the people involved and explain why it's important. Remember, these things are for violations. And my feeling is that 95% of all the people in a co-op obey the rules. It's really for the 5% who don't, and they have to be stopped. Otherwise, they make life miserable for everybody else. So get the people involved, and then you have to have a vote. And let me just ask you, logistically, when you buy an apartment in a co-op, you're given a proprietary lease. Right. So you could have 100 units. There are 100 proprietary leases. If the co-op makes changes on that lease, just logistically, are we printing 100 leases and or do we just do amendments or how does that work? Well, that's actually a great question. What I recommend to my buildings is that if you're going to be doing minor changes, you have to give it to the people. Otherwise, if you ever end up going to court, a judge is going to say, but they never got a copy. So send out a short, maybe one or two page replication of what was changed. Send it out and say, please staple this to your proprietary lease. This is an amendment. On the other hand, and this is, I think, what you were hinting at, if there are really wholesale changes, then what we do is we have a brand new lease called an amended and restated lease. It's the brand new lease with all the provisions in there, and we actually have people re-sign it. If people have financed their purchase, because remember, they don't have the original proprietary lease now, the bank has it. So what happens is they can communicate with the bank get the old one and replace it with the new restated lease. Banks don't really care if it doesn't affect them. So just give me a takeaway for boards who are considering modernizing their proprietary lease. What are the things that they should really have top of mind before they embark on this? I think the number one thing they should do is make a list of things that don't work in the co-op or could work better. Then when you speak to your lawyer, the lawyer can look at it and see what theoretically is the problem. In other words, for example, I, I don't know, in, insurance. Maybe the insurance issues never come up for the board. But the lawyer will say, listen, you really should consider it. So between the lawyer's list looking at the lease and the practical list of what's going on in the building, together the board and management and the lawyer should be able to come up with some good changes. We want the support of the people. And the way you get the support is don't overcomplicate it and do things they're going to say, hey, that's a good idea. We should have it. So it's a balancing act. Sure sounds like a balancing act. Andrew, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Take care, Carol.